So the whole keto hater thing, where did this come from? So I did the keto diet. I've spoken about this on the podcast yeah. so much, but for people who ha- may have not heard this, this episode that I did with Simon or a few of them, I, I was low carb for seven years as a type 1 diabetic and had fantastic results, like really, really nice, stable blood glucose control, pretty good insulin sensitivity. For the most part, all of my biomarkers were r- right where I wanted them to be. I took it to the extreme. I went keto for about four months. The first two months, even better results, like flatlined blood glucose, very low insulin levels, exogenous insulin as in my, my requirements were very low. And then I ran into a proper hurdle where my hepatic glu- glucose output overnight, my fasting glucose in the morning was just on its way up day after day, week after week, month after month. So I increased my basal and I kept increasing my basal trying to cover that liver output. It was like it wasn't working. My basal dose was just not doing the trick. So I I had this high fasting blood glucose for months. When I try to educate people around sort of the insulin carbohydrate relationship, we talk either insulin carb ratio when you're eating. So one unit of insulin will metabolize X amount of carbohydrate. The other thing we talk about is insulin correction factor. So when your blood glucose is whatever the number is, how many millimoles will one unit of insulin drop your blood glucose? So for me, both of those numbers started to increase. So I needed more insulin for a given amount of carbohydrate, even if it was very, very small. And my insulin correction factor kept climbing. So if I found that I was high in the morning for, from this overnight fast where my liver had put glucose out, what used to get me back into the normal range, I now needed twofold, threefold, fourfold. And this just kept going on for weeks. And I, I, was, I was actually such a keto lover at the time that I couldn't let go. And I was like, no, nah, this is fine. It's just a phase. It'll go away. And it didn't for two months. So I dealt with it for two months. My conclusion, as you've probably read in my writing, was that I'd lost glucose tolerance. I'd lost metabolic flexibility, a term that we've spoken about today many times. And that to get it back, I had to do something to my diet because that was the factor that had changed. I was still training the same. Everything else was the same, right? So yes, I've written, the, written sorry, that the keto diet was detrimental to my health and that it was terrible for my diabetes management. But I'm not anti it. I'm just saying <laughs> long term, I think that long term, yeah. and, and this is, I've received hundreds of messages from people in the same position as me who are type 1, living with type 1 diabetes, did keto long term, ran into the same hurdles. So for me, cyclic may be fine. Yeah. Um, but long term, months and months and months, that's what I have a problem with in this particular situation. So that's where the, the keto hater thing came from, right? It's that long term. I just it didn't yeah. work for me. I've seen it not work for many other people, and I think that you do run into some problems. Yeah. Um, yeah. 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 No, I. <laughs> you're not actually going to get an argument from me. Oh, because, <laughs> <laughs> no, because yeah, you know, I, um, I, 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 I did keto back 2013, 2012, 2013, 2014. I was very much into it myself. Yeah. Card carrying, keto. Um, fanatic. Yeah. Um, I think I've had my license rebuked since because I, I don't advocate as much. But the long term data isn't there, right? So we know historically the platform on which the keto diet was built is all on a lot of the tribal data or um, paleo diet worlds and what have you. Yeah. Certain cultures that could live off very low carbohydrate worlds. Mm. Um, and so people would argue that, well, there's long-term history that it works for those long-term right. cultures. Um, however, I firmly sit in the world as well uh, where it's a, a cyclical thing mm. that you can get into. Yeah. Well, um, which is more likely if ancestrally you would you would think that there would have been periods of famine. Yes. Um, which is kind of similar to a ketogenic sort of state, right? And that would have been more of a cyclical nature. Yeah, or if tribes are nomadic and yeah. not necessarily Their settled. food source will change depending that's right. on and where so, they are or seasonally or, yeah. Yes, mm. and so if we're getting our food history either from scrap heaps that we find in settled campsites or from journals or logs of observers, well, much like we pick on modern day nutrition for only doing one 24-hour food recall at one point in time, we could potentially just be looking at one particular point in time and that's what they hate. Yeah. Um, but again, you go from the lived experience. The research studies that have prospectively put people on the keto diets, they're not long-term studies. So we yeah. don't know what that long-term keto adaptation right. role could do to you. The data where people have done studies for a few days, up to a few weeks, up to a few months, with biopsy data shows that the machinery to burn carbs 
reduces. Yep. So you stop making the enzymes that break down pyruvate and mm -hmm. you have lower glucose transporters and what have you. And that would add some credence to your own N equals one experience of lost metabolic flexibility. Mm. Yeah. Because the metabolic flexibility definition is the ability to shift between fuels in response to an environmental stress. Yeah. And what you could see there and what we see in um, certain populations, if you go very low carb and then you give them carb, they would look like they're insulin resistant because they don't have the machinery around right. yep. to metabolize it. Yep. And so anyone who's had an oral glucose tolerance test would see, I think still the modern day instruction is to make sure you eat 400 grams of carb a day, day for yes. two days Correct. before the test. Mm. That came about mostly because in the 60s, I think it was, or 70s, uh, the data show people were observing in clinics, particularly mm. this guy Joseph Kraft was showing if you had people who ate habitually a low-carb diet that had this worse appearing glucose tolerance test, mm. but if you got them to retest right. after a couple of days of eating carbs, they looked normal. So yes. it was diet-induced rather than pathological. Yes. Exactly right. right. Yeah, And that yeah. is because a lot of the carbohydrate-burning proteins, particularly the ones in the liver, mm -hmm. are what we call inducible. So if you don't use them, they're not there. And then if you eat them, they are there. But it might take 24 to 48 hours for the right. DNA to make the new protein and then be functional. Gotcha. So, And we see that in rodent studies where they feed them on ketogenic diets. The animals look like they're diabetic if you do a glucose tolerance test. Right. Retest them a few right. days later and they okay. come yeah, back and, and metabolize I mean, the so, problem. So that's, that's more thinking about, I guess, the ketogenic diet in the context of managing diabetes and thinking about um, blood glucose control. But a lot of the claims online that, that I see related to the ketogenic diet are that somehow it's better for mitochondrial health. So is there, is there any sort of evidence of that? Is, that? is there a case to be made, let's say, for example, adopting a ketogenic diet in whatever uh, flavor you desire? Um, there are a lot of different foods that could, make, could, could sort of uh, be within a, a ketogenic diet. But is there a case to be made for doing it in a cyclical nature for some benefit with regards to the mitochondria? So it depends upon what their indicator of metabolic health is, right? If we're talking about the capacity, so the definition of metabolic flexibility we are talking about before was a metabolically flexible individual after an overnight fast will have a low RER showing that they can burn fat and then they can respond to whatever stress you're doing. If you're exercising, you continue to burn fat. An individual who's on the ketogenic diet become rapid fat burners. Like their, their maximal fat oxidation can be three, four times what you'd see in yeah. a person who eats carbs. And right? just to be clear, that's mm. the fat in the diet. Yes. Right. Yeah, yeah. And so um, you look at that and you go, wow, they must have wonderfully functioning mitochondria to be able to do that because you can only burn fat in the mitochondria. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. Right? Um, and so you'd be sitting there going, all right, cool, we've got that kind of data to suggest that they're doing well. But the other thing to note with something like a ketogenic diet is it's very hard to eat a ketogenic diet that's full of ultra-processed foods. Mm. Now, we get general population are getting, I think it was 40% of our energy from discretionary foods, yeah. which are ultra-processed products. Mm. So the first thing you do for somebody when you put them on a ketogenic diet is you remove that. Right. Now, I know that you can go to Coles and get yeah. keto bars and what mm, have yeah, you, but sure. if you're doing it properly, you're not subscribing to that. That, right? that happens with everything, paleo. Yeah. That happens if someone does a plant-based diet. That's yeah. a commonality among all of those, yes. right? Yeah. Yeah. You shift away from the standard Western diet. You take 40% of calories from discretionary foods and push them to the side. Yes, yeah, and so when you start looking at people eating whole food patterns, then sure, there is definite indicators in that meal plan that would be um, positive for mitochondrial health because there's all of a sudden you're taking someone who wasn't eating any vegetables and they're all of a sudden they're eating vegetables. Sure, they're all only above ground and mm. they're only certain types, but at least they're eating some that they never did before yeah. and that brings along the whole with the, a whole heap of micronutrients and the like. Mm. So... Um, we recently, one of my PhD students recently completed a trial where we uh, recruited patients with chronic pain mm -hmm. and put them on a ketogenic diet for three months. But what we did was for the first three weeks, we didn't go keto, we just went whole food. Mm -hmm. And everybody got that run-in diet 
And then we randomized gotcha. to some stayed on it and some went keto. Okay. And at the end of the three months, we've got some distinct differences between the two groups on some of the measures of inflammation and body mass and what have you. But the bulk of the improvement in pain we saw in that three-week period, mm -hmm. right, where everybody was just eating the whole food diet. Yeah. And then what happens is after the, the ketogenic group continue to improve, but it might be another point, point right. and a half. The whole food diet, they also just kind of hover around there, but they were going from high scores of sevens and eights down right. to these fives and sixes. So the biggest benefit is potentially from what you eliminated. Yeah. So, and, and so it, I, so, you yeah, know, we've only done the one trial, right. it's 30 people, mm -hmm. it's, you know, as much as it's published, it's a pilot trial, but that's where I'd be sitting there going, right. well, the first thing that we would have to uh, ear to earmark is, yeah. That three-week period where we cleaned out some diet, we saw benefit mm -hmm. right there. Right. Um, and when we think of so when we think about going, somebody going from what general population I eat, what I'm typically eating, to a low-carb ketogenic diet, not only are you restricting carbs, but you're also cleaning out the diet. A lot, sure. Right. Yeah. So now, to look at it from what we're eliminating and what we're adding back in. Yeah. The two very important things. Yeah, and so. You know that's going to be a benefit. Yeah. Um, you know then also, as you touched on, Simon, in that keto world, you're kind of fasting right. um, or famining uh, because it's carb restriction that's in there. And in that world, fasting has particular um, components that stimulate mitochondrial synthesis. Right. Um, and so you would argue that there are probably elements in there that are also having that potential. Has effect. anyone looked at that, looked at s someone adopting a ketogenic diet over a certain period of time and looked at mitochondrial density? That's what I'm trying to think. I'm, I'm racking my brain to think of a study okay. I had and I can't think that there is one. We'll, we'll, we'll put a pin in that one for yeah. round two. I suspect we'll be back for round two. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> no, but it's so, so I guess my position on that is, is that I don't think that living in ketosis, in a state of ketosis long term, forget about what the evidence shows. I just, it, it doesn't feel like a, a healthy way to live if, if from my experience, I've saw these biomarkers changing. Like imagine if at, at the two month mark, which I imagine a lot of the studies are say four to six weeks or yeah, yeah, yeah. if I was one of those subjects, I would have come out of that study waving the keto flag being like, guys, it's the way to go. Like it was unbelievable. My blood sugar was the lowest it's ever been all the time. My insulin requirements are like, it's when you push it beyond that sort of eight week mark in my experience mm. anyway, is where I ran into the hurdle. So it's just like, I don't mind going in and out of it. It might be a great tool. I think there's a lot of people with type one diabetes who do it fairly long term and have great results. Yeah, I'm just saying be cautious about how long you're in it for. And if you start to see that your blood glucose is increasing in the mornings and you're needing more insulin, perhaps it's time to have a look at other options and maybe cycle out of it for a bit and then come back in. But as long as you, you've got that healthy framework of whole food based, minimal processed foods, if any at all, you're probably going to do, you're going to get the most bang for your buck out of that. And, and when you say cycle out of it, it's not cycling out of it back to a junk food diet. Correct. Right? Correct. It, it's cycling out of it going, well, maybe now I can increase, or maybe I can include rice and potato. Right. Yeah, you know, or some other starchy carb vegetable source that's in there yes. where you're kind of like, well, it's still bringing with it micronutrients. Yeah. It's not, I'm going to go start eating ultra processed bread. Absolutely. You know? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Right. Yeah. Um, so if you're sitting in that world going, I'm going to cycle in and out of it and have periods of time where I'm very low carb versus mm. moderate carb, but those carbs are still coming from a healthy food source yeah. and you can't, it'd be really hard to say that's negative. Yeah. Um, I agree with that. Yeah. So we're on the same page. Kind of. <laughs> I just don't post on Instagram about how crap it is. <laughs>